next we're going to hear from Linda McQuay, who maybe had something to do with some of you being here partially. Um, so I think I think most people know, but Linda McQuay is an acclaimed Canadian journalist, best-selling author. Uh, she writes for the Toronto Star right now, and she's written eight books on politics and economics, including the latest, The Trouble with Billionaires. So let's give it up for her. Thanks very much, Lana. And uh, let me just start by saying what a real honor it is to be uh, with this distinguished panel here tonight. Um, you know, Jim and Sam, and I've just discovered Nathan, but Jim and Sam for years have been heroes of mine, intellectual giant figures on the left. Uh, Jimbo, as he's known on Bay Street. Um, yeah, intellectual giant. I, know, I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Anyway, it's a great honor to be sharing a podium with them. Um, and it's a great honor to be invited to talk to the Occupy movement. Uh, boy, I am in awe of what you guys, and I like to consider myself part of your movement, but what you've been able to accomplish. And I mean, I've been kind of trying to push this inequality stuff all my life, or <laughs> things like that. And, uh, you know, the more I pushed, the kind of worse the inequality situation became. Uh, uh, you know, you guys pitch a few tents and you got the whole world's attention. So, anyway, I, I mean, partly what I want to say is just how incredibly important it is that we seize this moment because so much has been accomplished so incredibly quickly and you can see how much we've got their fear up by the you know the, the way they try and dismiss it um, dismiss the movement you know they, they keep saying things like what is their message <laughs> <laughs> I mean would it be any clearer like what part of the top 1% have too much wealth and power and are screwing the bottom 99%. What part of that don't they understand? <laughs> you know, it's, it also amuses me the way uh, the Harper government uh, you know, tries to imply, yeah, there might be some justification and for the Occupy Wall Street, but it's not relevant to Canada. <laughs> we don't have those kind of problems here. I, I mean, that is so ironic because, of course, to the extent that we did have a kind of milder version of capitalism in Canada, the Harper government has just been taking a sledgehammer to that and making us more and more like the U.S. <laughs> Interesting word. Uh, uh, now, I, I want to talk specifically about the inequality problem in Canada. Um, you know, and, and, and the simple truth is there's been a, just in the last 30 years, there's just been an absolute dramatic transformation, uh, like a, a dramatic transfer of income and wealth from the middle and the bottom up to the top, and, and, and the, particularly the very top. And, and in fact, this, tra this tra transformation is just having devastating impacts in all kinds of ways in terms of health and social well-being, certainly in terms of undermining our democracy. So this has been going on for 30 years, basically, since about 1980. <laughs> well, no, 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 just as I'm going to, actually, no, no, I'm going I'm to get to that, because I think it's more subtle than that. I'm talking about the particular assault that's been going on for the past 30 years, because of course there's always been significant extreme inequality, but what we've seen in the last 30 years is just way <laughs> over the top. And yet the amazing thing is that in the past 30 years, as this inequality has become so much dramatically more extreme than it was before, uh, the subject of inequality has kind of, until Occupy Wall Street, had kind of disappeared. It was kind of taboo. Like it was okay, you know, to talk about poverty, uh, talk about not enough money at the bottom, but you weren't allowed to cast your gaze up 
and look at how much money was being accumulated at the top. In fact, if you dared to talk about that, you were accused of, you know, being envious or, or being consumed with class hatred or any of these kinds of things. And the wonderful thing that Occupy Wall Street has done is just brought this whole issue right out into the open and said it's, you know, it's not just about poverty, it's about too much money at the top and how that utterly destroys the fabric of society and our democracy. I mean, among other things, I love the way Occupy Wall Street has really kind of challenged the whole business narrative. You know what I mean by business narrative, that kind of thing that we hear all the time on TV, all the commentators, and they have a kind of way of talking about the economy as if it was all a sort of a set of facts. Um, and, and the Occupy Wall Street, I think, challenges this beautifully. Of course, the, 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 the business narrative is just ripe with holes. Like it's just full of holes and full of flaws. It's ripe to be challenged. Uh, but for, you know, for so long, it wasn't being effectively challenged. I mean, the very centerpiece of the business narrative is that we have to keep taxes low on the rich, right? <laughs> you know, if we don't keep taxes, taxes low on the rich, like all hell is deemed to break loose. You know, that will just absolutely kill economic growth, et cetera, et cetera. You know all this. Uh, and yet, you know, the fascinating thing is there's really, there's really no evidence whatsoever to support that contention that high taxes uh, on the rich are going to devastate the economy. In fact, it just so happens that we can point to a perfect example of exactly the opposite happening, and that is the early post-war period in both Canada and the United States, where we had uh, much, much higher taxes, both on the rich and on corporations, dramatically higher taxes. Do you realize the marginal tax rate back then was over 90 percent? Uh, and yet, you know, you would assume, therefore, according to the business narrative, that must have been just a terrible, terrible time for for the economy, right? But wrong. In fact, just the opposite was true. It was the period of highest economic growth in both Canada and the United States ever, like before or since. So the, the evidence absolutely contradicts this business narrative we hear all the time, and yet they just keep repeating it. Um, in fact, it reminds me a little bit of uh, this uh, guy, Harry Frankfurter, a Yale University philosophy professor, in fact, a very prestigious guy, head of the philosophy department at Yale. And he did this wonderful piece in Harper's back some time ago where he talked about, uh, it was called Reflections on Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and he talked about the difference between bullshitters and liars. And he's saying, you know, liars, they just lie about things, whereas bullshitters kind of you know, spin the, the story, they, they're, they're indifferent to the truth. And, and so I think that's helpful to keep in mind, you know, so when you hear business commentators talk about, you know, high taxes are going to kill economic growth and all that kind of thing, they're not saying that because they believe it or because they're ignorant of the facts. They're saying it because uh, you know, to, uh, to put it in uh, Mr. Frankfurter's word, because they're basically they're greedy, money-grubbing, self-interested bullshitters. <laughs> now, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the findings in my book, um, you know, that, that uh, I, I wrote with a tax professor, Neil Brooks, uh, called The Trouble with Billionaires. And uh, I, I just want to quickly put, just put this in a bit of context because there are a lot of books about billionaires out there and the new rich. And most of the books are kind of, you know, very excited about the new rich and their contributions and the exciting lives they leave and everything. In fact, unbelievably, even in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, we're still seeing these kind of books come out about the rich. And in fact, there's one recent one, I don't know if you've seen, about this... Uh, hedge fund manager John Paulson. He, he's the guy that 
made $3.7 billion dollars uh, basically by betting against the subprime mortgage market and in the process, you know, helping to trigger the financial collapse, you know, therefore kind of giving him the all-time record for profiting from the misery of others. But, but despite that, there's actually a book out about this character <laughs> written by a Wall Street Journal reporter, and it's just full of praise. You know, in fact, you get a flavor of, by the title. The t title is the greatest trade ever. <laughs> you know, that may be the view on Wall Street and Bay Street, uh, but my guess is the view among ordinary people is closer to the protesters that actually marched down Wall Street right after the crash carrying a, uh, a placard that said, Jump, you fuckers! <laughs> Point out that, that our book is more in the jump you fuckers genre. <laughs> um, so, so basically, I want I want to talk about you know just how incredibly concentrated income and wealth has become in in Canada. Uh, you know, the last time income was this concentrated at the top, you actually have to go back almost a hundred years. You have to go back to the late 1920s. Uh, but of course. We know what happened uh, in 1929, there was the big financial crash and then followed by the depression. And as a result of that, there was tremendous anger among ordinary people. And they, they knew to direct that anger against the financial elite. And so in fact, what ended up happening was because of that political climate, labor and other progressives were able to make enormous uh, inroads <coughs> pressing on government, the administration of FDR, to push for dramatic changes, basically to push for st uh, st introduction of strong labor legislation protecting labor rights, and all kinds of other changes that change things dramatically. And so what you have coming out of the Second World War and into the post-war period is a dramatically different society than the unequal one that existed before 1929. And I don't want to exaggerate this too much because it was very much a capitalist society in those early post-war years. But it was a very different kind of capitalism than the capitalism we have today. And I think it's really important to recognize that. It was a capitalism where the benefits of economic growth were much more widely shared than they, than they are today or than they were before that. Uh, in fact, it's sometimes called the golden age of capitalism because it's a period of tremendous economic growth, but also really quite widely shared growth. Um, in fact, I can give you a sense of just how different it was. The, you know, it used to be in the, that pre-1929 period, the top 1% had 24% of all the income. In the post-war period, the top 1% have only 10% of all the income. Now, that income doesn't disappear. It's more widely distributed is the point. Um, uh, so, so, but we, we know that what ends up happening is that starting after 1980, you know, the Reagan Revolution, Thatcher, that, all that kind of thing, <coughs> Maroney here, uh, we start to see a pushback from the rich against these egalitarian gains made in, in that, in that post-war period. And so what we've, been, what we've seen in the last 30 years is in fact a dramatic Reversal box is pre-1929 type style <coughs> situation where in the past 30 years, all the income growth has gone to the top, to the top 10%, but particularly to the top 1%, in fact, particularly to the top 10th of 1%, the top 100th of 1%. And then at the same time that that's been happening, the incomes of ordinary people, this may ring a bell, uh, have, have been stagnated. They, they haven't progressed at all. In fact, if anything, the average wage has declined slightly. The median wage has declined slightly. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing is that, of course, ordinary middle class people are having to work almost twice as hard to keep up to the extent that they're able to keep up, right? Because it used to be single income families. Now it's basically the two income family in order to even just maintain any kind of middle class life. And meanwhile, at the top, at the top, you know, I like to particularly look at the top hundred, you know, one one hundredth 
0.1%. Uh, the growth has been phenomenal. In fact, in the last 30 years, that top 100th of 1% has quintupled their share of national income. They now have the largest share of the national income that that high income group has ever had in its history. Uh, in fact, you know, we can see it. We've had a, we've had a doubling of billionaires over the last uh, 15 years. So we now have 61 billionaires in Canada. Or another way to put it, in the early post-war years, the average CEO had about 20 times uh, the income of the average worker. Today, that average CEO in Canada has about 200 times the income of the average worker. Or to put it, you know, it, it's even more dramatic if you look at what's happening in the financial sector. I mentioned that character John Paulson, if you look at him, his income that year when he made $33.7 billion and brought down the world economy, um, that was equivalent to 82,000 nurses. He made as much as 82,000 nurses. I mean, how can that possibly be justified? You know, by what moral standard is that guy worth 82,000 nurses. By what moral standard, in what moral universe, is that guy worth even one nurse? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but of course, you know, I say, how can these things be justified? Of course, if you listen to the business narrative, they are justified, right? And they're justified but with arguments like, well, that's the working of the marketplace. That's the natural working of the marketplace. We can't interfere with that. If we interfere with that, we'll screw everything up. Okay? Well, you know, I guess, um, I guess I'm trying to think of a word to describe that theory. And I, I you know, I'm coming up with things like bullshit. <laughs> In the sense that they always make it sound as if the marketplace is some kind of you know, governed by these natural forces, you know, sort of like gravity or something, you know. Uh, whereas, in fact, the truth is, the marketplace is not governed by any natural laws or forces. It's governed by man-made, human-made laws. Absolutely. And those human-made laws can change. And when they change, you get dramatically different income results. So for instance, in the last 30 years, the reason that we're, you know, that ordinary people are doing so badly is because laws have changed. In, for instance, labor legislation has become much weaker. Um, review of, uh, you know, foreign takeovers, like what Jim was mentioning about the caterpillar situation, all that stuff has become much weaker. And as a result, ordinary people have lost ground. At the same time that those laws have been weakened, the laws that favor those at the top, you know, like stock options, uh, financial regulations of all kinds, those have become more favorable to those that, you know, to the, to the rich. So, so in fact, what, you know, the, the gigantic chasm between the incomes of those at the top and ordinary workers, uh, the truth is it has nothing to do with, you know, the actual contribution of any of those various people, uh, nor does it have anything to do with anything called the so-called free marketplace. What it has to do with is who holds the power and who gets to make the rules. And, and, and of course, the problem is that the rich have been far too powerful, and they're, they've been the one making the rules. But the good news is, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you know, to borrow a phrase, uh, we are the 99%. And so therefore, we actually have an opportunity to, in fact, change those rules if, if we want to. Uh, now, I'm seeing I only have two minutes, so I'm going to have to kind of cut to some... Because what, what I really, well, the point I really want to make is that, you know, there's many things that have to be done in order to change the rules, obviously make the system much fairer, but I want to just zero in on one kind of 
shortcut that is extremely potent in terms of changing the rules. And that is to change the rules of the tax system. I mean, there's all kinds of ways, you know, where there's all kinds of things we've got to do to invest more in education, invest in poverty reduction, invest in uh, housing, all kinds of things like that. Uh, stronger labor legislation, all those things are absolutely vital. But one of the quickest ways to actually bring about a dramatic change in inequality is by changing the tax laws. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the truth is that the tax system is an incredibly powerful tool because through it, we're able to, in fact, tax the incomes of the very rich, redistribute in a way to not only make things fairer for everyone, but to clip the power of the very wealthy, and also to, of course, provide the necessary money we need to fund our, our public programs. And it's because the tax system is so incredibly powerful as a tool that the rich, the business interests, are so determined to vilify it, right? We're always hearing about how taxes are terrible, taxes are the bane of our existence. In fact, the reason they do that is because they want to take this instrument of taxation out of the hands of ordinary people. In other words, out of the collective <laughs> will, because as long as we're able to use the tax system, I mean, the big fear back in the days when they introduced the income tax system, and it was a big fight to bring the income tax system in, the big fear on the part of the rich was, oh my God, in a democracy, once ordinary voters get a chance to vote on, you know, taxes, my God, they'll tax us out of existence. <laughs> it was a nice idea, but it didn't happen. But it's not too late. So my point is, <laughs> my point is, uh, you know, uh, the, the, and again, the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think, has been very good on this. And, and, you know, because the Occupy Wall Street, for instance, Flaherty, the finance minister, has been kind of pushed, you know, about some of the tax, you know, should, they tax, should we tax the rich? And he was saying, he's kind of poo pooed. He says, oh, there's no point in doing that. You could, you, if you tax the rich, that can't pay to run the country. <laughs> well, it may be that it can't pay to run the whole country, but it could sure make a hefty contribution. For instance, Neil and I, Neil Brooks and I, my co-author, we recommend in our book <coughs> that in addition to the normal tax, system, tax rates that we have now, uh, there's, we should add uh, the, the top tax rate in Ontario is basically, you know, add in the provincial ones, the federal ones, but basically around 45%, same across the country. We suggest that for incomes above 500,000, because the top tax rate clicks in at about 130,000, that's pretty low <coughs> compared to some of these huge incomes. Anyway, we say for incomes above 500,000, there should be a new top tax rate of 60%. And for incomes above 2.5 million, and there's a lot of people making that, or not a lot, but there's enough that it's significant, there should be a top tax rate of 70%. And if we were to do just those two things, which would not hurt, I mean, that would not touch anybody in below, in the 99%, <coughs> even remotely, we'd be able to raise an extra 8 billion a year. Wow. You know, which is just enormous. Okay, so I, 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 do, I do recognize I'm out of time. But I, I want to quickly just conclude by saying, you know, that what, what we need is like a really powerful campaign to bring back, to restore the progressivity of our tax system. Because we used to have a progressive tax system in this country, much more progressive than we had today. That's what we had in that early post-war period. And that's one of the reasons it was much more egalitarian. And I would argue that this campaign has got to be argued not just on economic grounds, but on moral grounds, mm -hmm. on strong moral grounds about what kind of society we want to live in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let me just, uh, and part of that is going to be to the need to limit the power of the top 1%. I'll just close with one idea that I think deserves much more attention than, again, it's an idea from our book, 
Um, and if you're looking for a gift for Valentine's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but, but, but the, here's the idea. Bring back an inheritance tax. Canada used to have an inheritance tax, but it was quietly done away with in the 1970s. And, and we are actually one of the few countries in the Western world that doesn't even have an inheritance tax today. Okay, and, and, and I think this guy's working for the grid. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll just quickly say, so the idea would be, you know, first of all, the inheritance tax, it only affects the people, uh, like you know, in the top 1% and, and above. So it's a great tax on that front. So what we propose is any inheritance larger than 1.5 million, which is quite a lot, really, uh, you know, would be, would be subject to tax, okay? In the same way that ordinary income is subject to tax. I mean, why should it be that if you earn money from income, you pay tax, but if you earn money from sitting there doing nothing, the kind of thing Jim was talking about, the kind of financial, you know, your money working for you, you don't pay a cent, you know? I mean, actually, uh, Warren Buffett referred to that as the ovarian lottery. Yes. <laughs> you're just lucky because you're sort of born, you inherit all this stuff. But anyway, our, our, our idea allows if you have, if we were to collect that, that tax just on people, that inheritance tax, just on people making, you know, receiving more than 1.5 million in inheritance, a tiny, tiny group of Canadians, we would get enough money from that, and that's, by the way, the same as this is pattern on what goes on in other European, other advanced countries. We'd have enough money from that, get this, to create educational trust funds for every Canadian child, so that when every Canadian child turns 16, he or she would have $16,000 automatically de deposited into the educational trust fund to be used exclusively for education or training. Imagine what that would do to our society. Thank you. Very much.